Disclaimer. We are two regular guys who love to talk Bone Thugs and Harmony. We do not represent Bone Thugs or any Bone affiliate. We are also not Bone Thugs experts. The views and information you hear in this podcast may be based on personal opinion. Please feel free to leave corrections and clarifying information in the comments. And enjoy. As is, uh, I, you know, I, he, he's heavily hated on in the Bone community. Uh, I, you know, I like Kaz. I, I, I like his story. I don't, you know, I'm not going to sit and say everything he's done, maybe the, the cleanest thing or, or maybe the most thumbs up thing in the Bone world. Uh, but but I, I like the guy's hustle. He, he did release like a lot too. of albums under uh, what, what is called Mo Thug Records. Um, I, yeah. I look forward to having him on the, on the show. Uh, in the future, I like so it I too. You know, listen, I Kaz is smart. You know, and yeah. the thing I can say about Kaz more, than, I, I like him as a rapper. Actually, I wouldn't have put him on aggravated thought. And I did a solo record with Kaz and Lady, a rock record. It's really good. It's called I Am. It's, yeah, it's tight as fuck. Have you ever heard the song I Am? I'll send it to you because I don't, I don't care don't if we can. Yeah, it's it's on one of Kaz's records. It's called I Am. It's really good. Kaz, Lazy, who else is the rapper on it? Uh, there's another rapper on it. And he, he you know, Cash shouts me out in it. Just, like, big up to my nigga Rome for doing this bomb-ass track or something like that. You know, me and Cash are cool. Uh, now, yeah. does is he on Mo Tug or does he on it? I don't think so because he, Cash is way too smart. Cash is a hustler. You know, he's a street hustler, right? I think Cash, you know what, let's just get into it. The first time I met Cash, there was a gang of chicks around him. And he said, I can have whichever one I want. That's how I met Kaz. It was at my studio, as a matter of fact, at the back room. And so that's how I met Kaz. That's all I know about Kaz, and I was his best friend at that point. There's, there's a couple things that I, I know i got to make sure that we cover that we have. In, oh, go for um, it, man. I'm, I'm and, sorry. And, and, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm you're good. I, I, we we don't right. want to take up too much of your time. I'm like, man, we're, no, we're, good, man. we're killing this guy. Um Oh, one good. of the big ones, and I and I've been waiting to 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 ask this one until we could really. By the dive way, let me ask it. you this real. Let me ask you this real quick. You're gonna chop pieces up, aren't you? Because you're not gonna put in yeah. all the bullshit. You know. Okay, good. No, I we we, we no. I I, I will. Okay. Uh, I go through and do edits. It'll be good. And you should actually edit it and release because it's so long. You should release different parts at different times. I mean, really drive. Yeah, we we always do. We we release because uh, a lot of episodes lot and of, pieces. Yeah, because a lot of the things that I'm talking about. Nobody really knows. So, I mean, chop it up and make it last. I mean, make it, you know, like drive a lot of traffic to it. Cause, and the reality is the one that comes up to you on the, online or calls you and says, uh-uh, that's not what happened. Guess what? I'm telling you right now. Get me on the phone. Because, <laughs> listen, the bottom line is this. How do you fucking know that didn't happen? Because I've been there with these niggas for 23 years, and there's not a lot that I don't know. So... How how do you, you know? Oh, that didn't really happen. Like Rome said, really? Okay, hang on, I'll call. And once you say that, they'll probably back down because everybody knows that it's very hard to get a hold of me in the hip hop world because I make movies now and I kind of stay away. Crazy, all with one phone call. Lazy, one phone call. Rob, his manager or whatever their relationship is, one phone call. There's people, you know. You know, I just was, I just did a show with Bone Thugs and Harmony in Seattle a few months ago and just cut uh, the lady said, nigga, get on the stage, bring your guitar. I did. And we rocked it out. Anyway, anyway, go ahead with the questions. I'm I, 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 I love to hear that you're still, that you, you know, you're still working with Bone in, in that capacity. We know, we know you're working on, you know, Sons of Sinclair, and I got some questions around that. But before we do that, uh, a huge chunk of questions, you know, I've 
I put this up on a, a lot of different bone message boards that we were going to interview you, and, and a lot of the questions that fans have are obviously around the Graveyard Shift project. So I'm going to dive into that piece a little bit for you. All right. Um, you know, the, the first, I guess, thing, and, and you kind of covered this a little bit talking about, you know, they, they wanted you in, in Graveyard Shift. What was mm -hmm. it that linked you, you know, because, I mean, you worked on all of these guys' projects at this point, you know, is what we're hearing. Yeah. But there's something yeah. special about Graveyard Shift. I mean, we as fans associate you as a member of Graveyard Shift. What, what yes. happened that, that put you in this group and, and you really shaped that, that fucking sound? Like, what made them special and, and, and made Romeo Antonio say, I, I got to be with these guys over, I got to be a member of Poetic Hustlers or whatever. I'll tell you, it was um, lazy. Well, it was actually crazy, too. Um, when they were talking about Tombstone and Sin and Gates, you know, they were graveyard shift. Because, um, you know, I'm that rock and roll nigga. That's how they call me, you know. And so lazy kept talking about graveyard shift. And I hear, you know, their names shouted out on the first, you know, it's the first of the month, you know, that's how their names are shouted out. Uh, I'll let a couple of the graveyard ship on the first, right? So I'm like, who the fuck are these graveyard shit niggas you're talking about? Oh, nigga, T-Rock, right? And that's what Lady kept telling me. He, he's um, musically incredible. He's like, he's like you. I was like, nah, he ain't like me. He played guitar. He's like, nah, man, he plays a little bit of keyboard, but... You know, that nigga will show up with some, like, a black leather jacket on and some boots, and he will come up, like, and act like a rock and roll nigga. I said, oh, for real? So that's how I first started hearing about T-Rock, Tombstone. And I was like, oh, for real? He's like that? He said, yeah, he's different, man. He's real different. And that's what Lazy kept telling me. He's different. I was like, oh, is he a rapper? And he said, uh, he is now. So T-Rock, Tombstone wasn't, I don't think he was really a rapper, just like uh Soldier Boy wasn't really a rapper at first, right? So I, I don't know what T-Rock, I think he was more of a producer maybe um, because his style is very militant, just like Sam, but it didn't come from Sam. Sam was not a rapper at all. Tombstone probably is that guy in Graveyard Shift that has more to do with anything else and is very militant. And so um, when Lazy Bones, started talking to me about Tombstone. He wasn't in L.A. yet. He, you know, all the other Motugs were there. And we, you know, I'd done three, four records before I even met um, Tombstone. So he came in and he's staying at the hotel or whatever, you know. We started rapping. And he's like, man, um, Lazy and Crazy says, I got to meet you. I was like, What's, what is it about you? He said, shit, man, I don't know, but I've been hearing about you for months, too, talking about me. I was like, all right, well, shit, I don't know. Maybe we should, you know, like get in the studio and fuck with it. He said, well, that's why I'm here. We, we, we're going to be making a record. And I was like, oh, well, shit, all right. I guess, am I going to produce the record? And he said, yeah. So, I, you know, I check everything with Lazy and Crazy. I was like, so are they the next one I'm, I'm doing on Motog? He said, hell yeah, nigga. And that's kind of how it started. I was producing them just like I would be doing Poetic or Too True or whoever. And so I started, and I started fucking with, um, T-Rock, Tombstone, and the cat was very different. I mean, outside. And if you listen to the Graveyard Shift record, you'll understand what I mean by outside. And it intrigued me so much because I'm such a jazz person. I'm all about um, three, five, seven times. You know, three times, five times, seven times. Seven times is one of my favorite signatures. I can go to nine times. And which I'm just to fuck you up. The seven is my favorite signature. Well, Tombstone had all that in his head, so he would play like different loops that you know on his keyboard because he brought a keyboard from on Cleveland. I forgot what it was, the whatever kind it was, but he would play a loop on it. And I'll be like, oh shit, well that's some different shit, damn. That's that ain't like poetic or any. He's like, yeah, man, I, you know, I'm just trying to do something different. <laughs> you know, and he starts like with this militant, almost like. Almost like, you know, you watch the movies and you see the drill sergeant. He's like that cat, right? And and he's a little dude. He's not tall. You know, he's not a, not a big cat. And so the loop would be going, and he would be, you know, and all this shit. And, uh, but it wasn't military stuff. It was biblical. And it fucked me up. I was like, oh, shit. Did you just, what, where did you get that? 
What did you just say? Is that from the Bible? And they go, what? You know, and it was some deep ass shit. When we lost him, we really lost something. I'm telling you this, and I will say this to anybody. You lost the next super duper fucking star, and somebody knew it. I'm telling you that. This cat walked in with such a different outlook on how music should be made or, or portrayed, and I fell in love with the cat. I was like, damn, nigga, so was you ever in the military? He's like, no, nah, man, I just, you know, when I say something, I mean it. You know, and he, he would give me that. So if you listen to any records with him, even like the records he's on, like Ain't Said No Name, but Crazy Bone, he's just got that sort of military thing going on. But his shit is about the street in a militant way and about the Bible. And well, Was it primarily his passing that prevented the release of Stillwaters coming out on, on Mo Thugs, or was it, you know, other factors um, outside of that? It was me. Um, uh, Cliff Culture and Alan Grump. I almost got sued by uh, Relativity for not giving up the Masters. Um, and it's, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been mad if I got to because it was so personal to me that I felt like they didn't deserve these masters. You know, later on, I, you know, I was talking to a, a girlfriend or somebody, and she's like, you should just put those out on the Internet because people need to hear it. That's some good shit. I was like, eh, I don't know. It took years for somebody to talk me into releasing anything because I was so upset. Now, when I say so upset, you know, I cried for a week and friends died. When Toonstar got killed, I was looking to get some get back. I was very, very angry, and I'm not that kind of guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a rock and roll cat. You know, I'm an intellect. I'm not really a street cat, right? But I could, I'm from Queens, so I could get street. I was very, very upset. I'm the guy that went to the police department in Cleveland asking, what the fuck is wrong with you? How come there's no lead? What you mean we don't have a nigga? You know, I went on my own dime. I mean, I, you know, I had it. I mean, I, you know, I was doing really well because all my records were selling. I was very, very upset. I hired a private investigator. That's how upset I was because I felt like, you know how some people feel like when Tupac died, they took something from you? Uh, I didn't yeah. feel like I mean, I knew Tupac, a great guy. The day before he died, I was at Tower Records with him on Sunset. We were talking about records and laughing, and he was a great guy. When Biggie died, people in Brooklyn went crazy, right? When T-Rock died, he wasn't a star yet. But I knew what, what, we, what we had. I went crazy. I was so upset for a long time. I'm talking years, not a couple of days, not a week. Uh-uh. But it wasn't a cry type of thing. It was a, I'm going to get somebody. And I'm not that kind of dude. That's the other thing that, that you have to understand about me. I'm not that kind of guy, you know what I'm saying, to to be like, oh, I'm going to get somebody. Nigga, if I go to jail, oh, well, I'm about to get somebody. And that's that's how I sort of came. In fact, when I – Were Sin and Gates, were were they in that same mentality uh, as as you at that point? I don't think Gates was because he was already out. Um, Because he wasn't uh, on Stillwaters, is that correct? Like, he he didn't make it on that? I don't think he was on Family Reunion either. No, he was out before I started any most of production. Gates was out. Gates wasn't on Family Reunion. He was out before I did Poetic Cuffs. He was out before I did Two True, True. There was no Gates. Oh, I knew about him, but something had happened with one of the guys or whatever, but he was out. Uh, so, no, he wasn't even considered. We didn't save spots for him on any tracks on Still Waters. Now, we have a lot, of, I mean, crazies all over Stillwater, ladies all over Stillwater. We have a lot of, of people on Stillwater. Everybody wanted to be on it. You know, that's kind of what happened to Aggravated Assault. We'll talk about that later. But um, when I went to Cleveland uh, to talk to the police department to hire some private investors, I flew, I, you know, from L.A. I didn't go to Cleveland. I flew to New York, and I drove to Cleveland. And there's a reason, because you can't get on a plane with what? Artillery. So, nigga, I went to Queens, and I got the van, and I loaded it up with some friends, and some, and I went to Cleveland because I wanted to know. I was very upset. And going to jail was okay with me at that point. That's how much he meant to me. We're talking about somebody. So you think, or some people think Tupac is a huge loss, right? 
not compared to that guy, not even close. And I knew Tupac. Biggie, not even close. You're not even close to Tupac. I mean, you know, to me, wow. everybody's got their own thing, right? But we're talking about a musician. Do you understand why I'm at? So you're talking about a cat that can play the piano, that understood harmony, and he understood um, melody, very melodic. And so you're talking about a thug prince is what you're talking about. That's what he meant to me. He was like Prince, but in a little thug-ass body from St. Clair, Cleveland. That's what I thought of him. I was very upset. I mean, very upset. The fact that him and Crazy, but they were married or had a, she was pregnant or something else was going on. I wanted to get down to the bottom of all of it. I was very, very upset. I mean, very upset. So when the heads of relativity started calling me, I'm started calling me at home and all that shit. Uh, you need to send the masters. I was like, fuck you, and I'd hang up on them. And these are people that I liked at Relativity, you know, and Sony. Because and, they did pay for that record to be made. Because the record was done when when Tombstone got killed. You got to remember that. And I did right. about 30 songs, about 30 of them. They were done. And we were doing master. You know, I was mastering it at Bernie Grunman or you know, whatever I do in the mastering. And they were taking photos for the album cover and all that shit, trying to figure out where I fit into it. Because at that point, during the time that Lazy Bone came to get in records, and Crazy Bone and everything, oh, nigga, you with this group. I was like, what do you mean I'm with this group? I produced this group, just like, you know, Party Cutler. And they're my friends too, by the way. All the guys in Correct, we love each other, right? Anybody who spend that kind of time with you, love them. But, they, everybody looked at me because pretty much every song that Tombstone or because Sin, let's just say he wasn't a rapper, but he became a rapper, and it was all about prophecy with Sin. Tombstone too, but by the time Sin got to it, the track was done. The song was pretty much done, that sort of thing. So the the way that it came to be, some songs like me and T Rock to split them up, six and six, seven, seven songs, whatever. And I'll say, okay, give me three of your beats, and let me give you three of mine, and let's fuck with it. That's how we would do it. And then we go in the studio, and, like, one of his beats will go, and i say, all right, man, well, let's change this chord to that chord, and let's change this to that, and then, and then. And then a couple of songs, he's like, yeah, man, let's turn down the rock, down the rock guitar on this song, because people won't get it in the bone world. I was like, okay, okay, I feel you, I feel you. So he had a lot of input on me not rock. I mean, there's a couple of songs on it that are heavy fucking rocked out, because we wanted them to be, you know. Now, if it was up to me, I'd have probably rocked them all out. But Tombstone's like, no, let's turn it down on this one because the Bone fa- fan base won't understand. I said, nigga, I don't think the Bone fan base is going to understand this whole record. We got to come hold so different. We had marketing meetings at Relativity separate from any of, none of the other Mo Thugs had marketing meetings at Relativity because they were all floating off of Bone Thugs and Harmony. Uh, Graveyard Ship, we were actually – planning a tour, a rock tour, you understand, with rock bands. So wow. it, was, it, it, it was to be so different. I mean, we were still Mo Thug, and we were actually planning a tour with Bone Thugs in Harmony where the Mo Thug would open up for Bone. And, you know, like Poetic do a couple songs, Two True Do, because Graveyard, we go do, you know, that kind of thing. So basically I'd be standing on the stage the whole fucking night, which was cool. I didn't give a fuck. So we was definitely a part of Most Thug, but very different part of Most Thug. Almost like we had our own thing. So much, so much that Relativity Records was a rock record before it became a rap, a, a, a rap label. It was a rock label. They signed Megadeth, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, a lot of the rock gods that I love, Vai and Satriani. That's, by the way, how I got introduced to Relativity Records, Alan Grumblatt, and Cliff Coltrane. Cliff Coltrane owned the most sought-after uh, amp and guitar collection in New York, in Long Island. So in the fucking world, I would call Cliff Coltrane and say, hey, man, I need this amp c- combined with this Stratocaster, and he would put that shit together for me because he was, you know, he was just a guitar genius dude, you know, like, like about the tubes and the amp and shit. So that's how I actually met those cats at Relativity, how I got to go to that Bone Thugs and Harmony session for Mo Thugs and all that. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was very different. 
with Graveyard Shift. I was bringing back to relativity the rock era that they came from. I mean, was, listen, they was get Stillwater is going to be a Mo Thugs release, or was it going to end up just a, a relativity? It sounds like they were going almost going to get pushed bigger than than the Mo Thugs push. Absolutely, straight relativity, uh, because you have to remember, I didn't sign the Mo Thugs uh, contract, and Graveyard Shift became me and T Rock. Sin too, but Sin, uh, you know, he did his verses. Uh, but he didn't have any production on it. He didn't own any production on it. So it was me and T Rock. And I didn't sign that contract. So when I was, I mean, this all happened at the same time. If you remember, we were actually on tour when when he got killed. So it, it, when I was working at Motug, I was doing four or five things at once, always. That's why I made a lot of money, because I worked a lot. And so I was. Uh, mixing that record and mastering it, different records and, you know, different things going on with the Graveyard Ship record. And I set up uh, a, a meeting with Relativity with Graveyard Ship because it was so different from everything else on Motha. It almost wasn't. It was more like, you know how, um, let's see, like uh, like Limp Biscuit. It, that's who we would have toured with. That It was that kind of shit. But we were wow. way before there was a Limp Biscuit. We was way before any rap rock shit. Kid Rock hadn't come out yet. So we were kind of pushing that shit off. We were, we were the, you know, we were just new, and we had a bone thug base, and we had a lot of money around us, and we had Relativity Sony, which is a rock label. So guess what that record would have done? That would have been bigger than Ghetto Cowboy. It would have been bigger than any Mo Thug record. I'm talking about the whole album. And it might have eclipsed. Bone Thugs and Harmony. That's how they were talking at Relativity, because wow. they didn't want to give they didn't want to give Tamika at Ruthless her percentage on Graveyard Shift, because Romeo was not signed at uh, Mo Thugs Records, and they are basing the record deal at Relativity on Romeo. That, wow! Uh, I mean, so that was the workaround to, to make sure that Tamika was, couldn't that get her hands to, on that it. Way, that was the way to work, work around. Uh, so, uh, ruthless because wow. I didn't sign the contract. So, and I knew the guys at Relativity, and they said, okay, we're doing this record deal with Romeo, and Tombstone and Sin is in the band. And Lazy agreed to it because Lazy wanted to know up. Lazy, Lazy was great about it. And so that's how it was going to be. And my whole world came crashing down on me when that guy died, and uh, well, when he got murdered. If I remember correctly, that that album was set for a 97 release, uh, but we didn't see it released until, I, I believe, 2001, and it was released through your website. Um, you know, yeah. just take us through that, that decision, and, you know, that's, that's quite a few years later. I'm sure you were hounded by fans. I know that you were working on, you know, projects uh, of your own at the time. Take us through what made you decide to finally release Stillwaters to the fans. Well... I was upset, obviously, and yeah, it, we were set for '97 release, right? And we have—I still have all the paperwork. I still, you know, this, I still have everything, man. And I keep all that stuff because it, it means a lot to me, right? And so, year—I was mad. Year went by, nobody had any leads on who killed him. Which, come on, between me and you, uh, uh, Cleveland Police Department is like LAPD. You pay a nigga and they shut up. Well, LAPD is not like that anymore. That used to be how any police department was, New York PD, all of them. So I was very upset at the police department, at the mayor. I went after everybody because they, nobody, they were like, oh, we don't know. I was like, somebody knows. Put a, And, you know, I wanted to put a ransom and all that. But the police department, they didn't give a shit. They looked at it like just another rapper having a war with another rapper over some drug shit and they got killed. That wasn't what happened. Tombstone wasn't. It wasn't into the drug shit. That's not what happened. And so I was very upset about it. So a year went by. Relativity's calling me, trying to get that record. I didn't answer. I was like, fuck you guys. I'm working on something else. I'll call you back. Click. Never call them back. And they were my friends, the guys at Relativity. I really like Alan Grimblatt. So it was probably about, I don't know, 2001 or two. He said, listen. And, you know, with other people, my girlfriend at the time, she's like, this is a great record. People need to hear it. And Alan Grumbach wanted me to send him. They were doing a soundtrack on some movie, and he wanted me to send them some of the songs 
you know, a, a select few of the songs on the Graveyard Shift record. And I said, I'll send you a couple of them. And I did. Now, you got to remember, I did 30 songs, at least 30, because we were just jammed. We were living at the studio, sleeping at the motherfucker, waking up, doing a song. You know, we was, like, into it. And, by the way, that record took, like, a Poetic Custer's record, I probably did the whole record in two, three weeks. I mean, that's how I got down. Graveyard Shift, nine months at least. You understand what I'm saying? The difference is, yeah, yeah, you, and, and, and 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 that's why I said, you know, you seemed so much more personally invested in this. Not to say that the music would be, you know, the the other things that you did with Mo Thugs wasn't great, but if you if you're to ask any Bone fan, you know, hey Romeo Antonio, what's the first thing you think of? Graveyard Ship, boom, immediately. Yeah. That'll that'll be the first thing, um, and and Graveyard Ship is such a huge impact on the bone community for a plethora of reasons but but one of them is you know the the fucking mystery around it i think it was a huge relief when you finally did release it um you know we we know that there was a version that leaked out there the track list was a little different uh michael peters from the beyond the harmony facebook group wanted to know uh the story behind the rest in peace skit being cut from from the release of still waters uh, the rumor is that, you know, Sin just felt that was too personal to, to be included in full. True. Um, that's very true. Now, now, like I said, Sin, when when Tombstone got killed, Sin went nuts. I mean, he was actually locked up, for real. He, uh, so that's not a rumor. Yeah, he had a big problem with it. And so he wasn't around for a minute. And then he came back in on the Night Riders, I think, uh, when, when Crazy, uh, I don't know, we were in Miami. I, I don't I don't remember a lot, but well, I do, but I don't want to. Um, but, it, you know, so Sam wasn't around, and I had the Masters, of course, and I wasn't letting anybody have shit. And then so the rest in peace little piece thing that was done, it wasn't sincere to me. So I was like, nah, I'm just, uh, I'm not going to, I'm just going to put that in the drawer. The whole record went in the drawer, right? And then... Finally, some people at record companies, and like Alan Grunbeck called me. He wanted a couple cuts for a soundtrack. So I said, all right. And then somebody else was like, well, you might as well put it out so that people can hear it. And I didn't know any other way to put something out. I'm not a computer dude, but the girl, my girlfriend at the time, she's like, why don't you put it on the Internet and charge people a dollar? I said, I don't, I don't really know how that works, you know. And so I did. Oh, she did actually. She she did the site and everything like that. It was through Crystal Ball or one of my companies or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what it was. Yeah, I remember. But a lot of people, you know, so many people bought it and a lot of people. And then I started going, and that's the first time, honestly, I was I was realizing that. Well, damn, I guess people do know about Graveyard Shift, or this maybe might be important because I didn't up until that part. I was so engrossed into the bone world that I didn't know who even knew about Graveyard Shift. I didn't know that anybody knew who Tombstone was other than Crazy Bone Sister's husband or boyfriend, whatever. I didn't know anything because, you know, I was in my own little world. I was upset about it. Nobody would talk to me a lot about it because they would see me just, I used to go off on people. Like, you know, so like uh, amongst the bone people, they stopped, stopped talking to me about it. I'm talking about not people like fans are online or stuff. I'm talking about people like around our little circle. They stopped talking about it. Um, crazy would get upset too. Uh, and, you know, lazy too. Cause, I mean, lazy. So people stopped talking about it. So I didn't know who really knew what about Graveyard Chef. I'm not talking about the investigation on the murder. I'm talking about just the band or the songs. I didn't know. I really didn't know. And then you know, later when I started popping little things out here and there, I started realizing, I started seeing the traffic on, you know, the web and people started, I got hundreds of emails and I was like, well, what the fuck is this? And then I started asking around and people like Rob, who is like Lazy's manager, I'm not sure what he is, but. Uh, uh, Rob J, is that? Uh, just clear no, Rob J is, is uh, Crazy Bone's brother. No, that's Rob. You're talking about Rob J. Rob J. Must be talking about Robbie Rob. Yeah, Rob. I'm not sure what his last name is, bro. Um, Robbie Rob. You know, I just call him Rob. I know him for a long time. He's been around for a long time. 
But Rod J is Crazy Bone's brother, and you don't want to fuck with him at all. He was that dude. And Rob J was Lazy Bone's cousin. And um, so Rob, I'm not sure what his last name is. And I, I was just talking to Jamie Adler last week. He asked me about Rob. I was actually at the office. Um, they we talking about, you know, because his brother Stephen Adler from Guns N' Roses, he's going on tour. And he wanted me to go on tour and play guitar. Um, and so I was at his office last week, and I was thinking about it, you know. And, and me and Stephen Adler are really good friends. And so I'm thinking about it, you know. And, and you know. I don't know, still talk, still thinking about it, that sort of thing. But he said, hey, do you know who Rob is? This is Jamie Eller. I said, Rob, yeah, you mean Lazy Bones Rob? And that's how we kind of talk about him. Yeah, Rob, oh, yeah, that's my cat. Like, he's a nice guy. Whenever I talk to him, he's the nicest guy, you know. So, you know, a long time I've known him, a long time. So I'm not exactly sure. I do know forever, though, Lazy always, when it was Lazy Bone business, he would always say, talk to Rob. I don't want you talking to Lobel or anybody. When it, when it comes to me, talk to Rob. If you want to book something or you want to do a song or whatever, talk to Rob. I said, oh, you mean Rob? Yeah, yeah, my dude, Rob. In fact, it was just, I don't know, two weeks ago, I was talking to Lazy Bone, and we are talking about doing some shows this summer, and I'm going to go out and do some shows and do Welcome to the Jungle and, you know, do some shit with Bone like I used to, but just with Lazy. Now, I'm not sure who's going to be in it, in the show, but I know I'm going to, and Lady's going to, and he says, talk to Rob about it, because my other dude, Gary Darity from CSI, black guy with green eyes, like, like my brother, he's booking some stuff in Paris, and South France, and Italy for us, and it's Lazy Bone, Bone Thugs and Harmony, so I'm not sure if the other Bone members are going to be on it or not, I just know it's me and Lady, and listen, me and Crazy has done it, you know, we've all done it before together, so we don't need the other one. So at this point, when I was talking to Lazy a couple of weeks ago, he said, talk to Rob about it. I said, all right. So me and Rob started in back and forth. What dates are good for you? And I said, listen, you know, I'm doing a couple of movies this summer, but uh, I love music and I haven't done music and I will open anything up to do tours with Lazy Bone. And Rob's like, great, man. So don't book anything July, August, September, or June, July, August, whatever it was, three months. I was like, you got it, man. Um, so I'm not sure what those dates are, but Rob, I think Rob is the one putting those together. So anyway, Jamie Adler, who's their booking agent, Bone Thugs and Harmony booking agent, he said, do you know Rob? I was at the office. I was like, yeah, he's a good cat. And, you know, he didn't say anything one way or the other. He didn't say anything that's good or bad. He just said, oh, okay, because I don't really know the guy. I said, yeah, Rob's been around a long time, man, and he deals mostly with lazy, I think. He said, yeah, he said he was, he said he was lazy manager. I said, I've heard that too, so I think that's what it is, Jamie. You know, I mean, I don't know, you know, what it And so um, they are. Jamie's not, but I think Rob is putting. I don't know if Jamie's with them. Or, I'm, I'm not sure who's putting the dates together, but I know that we're going to go to Paris, Italy, and South France, and Australia. Oh, I awesome. do know that. In Australia, <laughs> and I'm not sure. Like if I'm going to do some Stephen Adler's dates, the Guns and Roses things, um, I'm, you know. I'm um, talking about. I'm thinking about. It. I do want to go out and do some uh, music this summer. I want to rip some assholes apart this summer with my guitar or bass or drums or whatever the fuck is on stage. I'll start with the guitar and then I'll work my way around the stage. So I'm gonna definitely do that this summer. And I told I told Rob, I was like, God. he's like, so what percent you want to do fifty fifty with Lay? I was like, fuck no. I said, you know. They could give me a per diem to eat on, and I don't really care. You know, I said, I'm not doing a tour with Lazy to put money in my pocket. I'm doing it because I miss music. And he's like, okay, oh, great. I don't know this and the other. And then, like I said, my dude Gary from CSI, he said it was from Paris, from Italy, and from South France dates. And, man, I just can't wait to get back on the road and do music because I'm going out and I'm going to light some people up because maybe they forgot. I don't know. what. Is, I don't know. But I'm just saying this. I'm putting on a clinic when I go out. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put my, like, you know, I used to wear the, the Tupac head bandana backwards when I went out with Bone. When I was, like, if I was yeah. with Lay or Clay and I was really going to get out on the guitar, I would turn my bandana backwards. My Bone bandana, i turn it backwards, like, like Pac. And when I turn it backwards, I'll get to light people up and 
take note. Time to zoom in on the fingers and the strings because I'm about to fuck people up. That's what I'm going to do this summer. I'm coming in on it. <laughs> awesome. If I miss it, you know, I miss playing. And, you know, listen, I, I, a lot of people, listen, if I put it out there that I want to go into this summer, I mean, you know, every rock band out there or R&B, I mean, everybody will hire me because I could play. But if I could do it lazy, man, are you talking about Shit, me and Wade, we could rock. I mean, if you look at a lot of pictures when, my, when I'm rocking out, who's usually next to me? Lazy or crazy? Lazy from time to time, he will reach over and start fucking with my guitar a little bit. Like, when I was jealous last time, he'll reach over and start, you know, turning the knob, the volume knob up and down, and just fucking with it. Because me and Wade, we get down. You know, he, he likes to rock. So, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to that. So let's go back to Graveyard Shift because I need to end it. I need to put a staple in it because I don't have closure. And it's been, you know, a, lot, a long time. I don't have closure, but I need to make closure because he ain't, he ain't coming back. He got killed. He ain't coming back. And they're still, to this day, it's, you know, unknown who murdered him. Somebody knows, I'm sure. But, uh, you know. But if you go to the police department, they don't know. Well, they might know, but they're not telling anybody. So that record is 2001 or two or whenever it was. The girlfriend or Alan from Black, somebody said, you should listen, you know, we're not going to sue you. We understand your stance on it. But, you know, you didn't have a contract with multi record, but you have one at Relativity. I was like, yep, sue me then. And he's like, no, we're not talking about that. Why don't you just... Yeah, you know, I'll help you put it out if you want. Because at that time it was Koch. Both well, turned into Koch, and it was still Alan Grumbach though. Now they're E1, and it's still Alan Grumbach. And I, uh, you know, we'll put it out for you, Koch. You know, I was like, yeah, you know what? Nope. And so I don't know, man. I just feel like I put my heart and soul into that piece of work, and that guy died. He put his heart and soul into it with me. We did it together, and he died. Yeah. And I feel like wow. Sin was with us, too, because Sin was with us. Lyrically, if you listen to some of the lyrics, Sin is cold-blooded. And guess what? Sin never wrote it down. That's what impressed me so much about Bone altogether, by the way. They would step up to the mic without writing. And Sin and Tombstone did that. Uh, you know, T- Tombstone would, would mess around with some four chords or a beat or something on there on this little drum, drum machine or a keyboard he had, and I'll sort of take it from there. But they didn't write a lot down. What came out of them came out of them. And that's so special to me. Because I know somebody yeah, else made write shit down, and when he stepped up to the mic, it was genius. And that was Prince. I don't know a lot of cats like that. You don't have to write it down, you step up to, my, to the mic, and it's genius. Yeah, there's only a few people on the planet that could do that. And Tombstone, and I have to say, a lot of people don't talk about Sin, but Sin is a great lyricist. He would, if you listen to those, that record, he would, he would, and it was all biblical stuff. I mean, he was really special. Both of those guys were yeah. really special. Tombstone died. There, there, there were no question, like, the most, <clears throat> if you talk, you know, like, like Bone fans, like the real hardcore Bone fans. That the Graveyard Shift album that you created with them, um, and and just that group, you know, I I would say is like the you know the favorite. They're, and and it's so crazy that they're the favorite because that body of work didn't come out uh, the way that you know it was originally planned. But people fucking love them, and I think it's what you're saying is. You know, me and John will talk a lot, and it's like, wow, wasn't it amazing that Mothugs 1 and 2, those, a lot of those cats, most of those cats were, were from Cleveland, and they just possessed that sound. But Graveyard Shift possessed something else. They, it was almost like the Mothugs have to shoot for Bones fan base, but Graveyard Shift, they, they could make their own fan base of, of motherfuckers that don't even care about Bones. I think they did. I think um, I think Graveyard Shift, because I started getting, you know, like, I don't know, late 90s and early 2000s. All of it, you know, still, I started getting people hit me up that are just Graveyard Shift fans. Because you have to remember, Graveyard Shift reached out to a rock audience as well because of a lot of those tracks yeah. on there. And 
you know, my dude, um, you know, Nine Inch Nails is, right? You're the Nine Inch Nails? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. So Trent Reznor is, is a Nine Inch Nails. He is, you know, he has a Nine Inch So when I was doing 2005, whenever I did that movie with Lazy Bone, I put in um, the soundtrack is laced up with a lot of that type of graveyard shift sound. And Trent Reznor, I let him hear a graveyard shift right there. We're talking 2004 or something, you know. And he's like, this shit is genius. I was like, and you're Trent fucking Reznor, and you sold a billion records, and this shit is genius, and it hadn't even come out. And he's like, well, you're wow. a genius. I said, it's not just me. I said, most of the downside, and when I say downside, I mean downside is in the beat, is Tombstone, because I'm a rock dude, so you could hear the songs on the record that sound rock, right? But most of the... And I say down, when I say down, I mean lay it down, like that's the drums, right? That's this guy, Tombstone. So you're talking about Trent Reznor saying, well, who was this fucking guy? I was like, man, he was kind of a genius dude. Well, where is he? I want to work with him. He's like, yeah, man, he died. It's like, what? Yeah, man, he got shot and killed. You're talking about uh, Trent Reznor. Uh, Trent you know, Reznor Graham wanted to work with Tombstone? Yes, a lot of people, not just them, uh, Marilyn Manson, when me and... um. We did a song with Flesh and Bone and Marilyn Manson, me and Damon Elliott. Uh, Marilyn Manson, you know, I played for him, the graveyard shift right here. I mean, I have played play for a lot of people who I thought were worthy. And uh, he's like, well, I got to work with this guy. I was like, man, he's dead. Because what I would do is I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, my friend, you know, he's in the scoop me, he's dead. Let me play it for you. I would play it for him first. Because I didn't want them to feel sorry and say, oh, that is a great record. I want to play right. with people and just get their reaction. So, I mean, I'm sure you know that uh, we did a, a record with Flesh and Bone and Marilyn Manson. It's kind of out there. I don't know which record they'd end up on. I think it was on the soundtrack. But when we were doing that record, we were at studio. I forgot the name of it, in L.A. But when Marilyn Manson came in with all his people, Marilyn Manson is sort of a – a spinoff of Trent Reznor and My Nine Inch Nails. He was sort of in that whole thing with them. So his people came in. And I played them, you know, sort of to get it in the feel of what kind of record. We, well, who is Bone Thugs and Harmony? Because Marilyn Manson knew who he was, but it's like, what kind of record we going to make with, with this guy from Bone Thugs? And I was like, well, let me play some shit to get you in the mood. You know what I play? Graveyard shit. Because it was crossover type shit for rockers. They could understand it. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. What's that record? I'm like, yeah. Graveyard shift, still water. Oh, well, I want to make a record with them. I said, Well, I am them for one, and the other one, you know. He's like, Well, let me hear it. So I played it for him. I didn't tell him he was dead until they say, I want to make a record with him. Yeah, he's dead. How do you die? I oh, got shot and killed. And it's sad because a lot of the rocker guys would say the same thing. You know what that is? Hmm. Yeah, that whole rap thing. Did he die doing the. East Coast, West Coast War. I said, well, they died around the same time, but it didn't have nothing to do with that. Because a lot of the rockers, even the pop people, when you talk about rap, they think that, and you say somebody died. I mean, they could be somebody not even related to Pac or Biggie. They think they all died in the same fucking thing, like the East Coast, West Coast War. I'm like, nah, man, he, died. he was in Cleveland. He died of some other shit. Really? I'm like, yeah, man. Because, you know, the white guys in the other side of the industry, not hip-hop, they don't know. All they know yeah. is Tupac and Biggie. Oh, they all got shot oh. up and killed. I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, it's, it's amazing to me to hear, you know, Trent Reznor, Manson, you know, things like that. I, I'm just going to say, and, and maybe I'm just out of the fucking loop, so if, if a fan is listening and knows about it, drop me a link. But I don't think I've ever heard uh, a flesh and bone Manson song. I'm going to say that first. So that's amazing news to me. Um, second, it sounds like, and, and I'm just trying to kind of figure this out for myself. It sounds like you're in possession of the entire Stillwater's Masters. Are, are you also technically the owner, or is that still relativity, or, or what's the situation with like the album itself? Well, uh, keep it real. I'm the owner because I created it uh, with Tombstone. He's dead. Uh, and, you know, whatever it comes in will be split with, you know, his kids or whatever. But a Relativity, yes, they are – well, there is no more Relativity. It's Sony, 
and they right, did Tony. pay for it, and they did pay for that album, so they would get their royalty as well. So I can say that I'm the, the creative owner, absolutely. But would they would Sony get a piece of it? Absolutely. I, they would sue me if I put it out like on uh, Death Row Records. You know, it, yeah, they'd sue me because that actually came up um, during Aggravated Assault, which was signed to Death Row Records. Um, you know, we have we haven't talked about aggravated assault, but it's so much. It's very important because a lot of the aggravated assault sound came from me being with Tombstone and me being with Crazy Bone and Lazy Bone. Because what I wanted to do was make a rock kind of, uh, but with hip hop on it, and cross the board hardcore. Like you know, because Limp Bizkit and all those guys, man, they were jokes. They were doing right. it, and they're selling our records. And it's corny. But, it's not really rap with rock. Yes, it's it's, it's cornball rap. rock guys rapping. Right. You you exactly. wanted to do real rap with with real rock. Yeah, and cross. You know, and oh, I don't know. You know how much crossover it would be, but it was definitely hip hop because you know I started off with a hip hop beat, and then I go in and play drums on it and then guitar and bass. And I played all the instruments on it, and I was very particular about it because there was a time period where when people would be in town, they would stop by the backroom studio just to get eight or 16 bars on Aggravated Assault Record. Everybody heard about it at that particular juncture. It was, there was a lot of hype, even in the bone world, when like um, <clears throat> Emotionally Destroyed dropped. Uh, oh, yeah, there was a couple yeah, of other ones. Was- when those ones dropped, there was a lot of hype around the Bone World because, you know, you, you also you had a bunch of Bone features on it, um, Graveyard yeah. Shift, you know. So there was a lot yeah. of hype for that for that record. And actually two of the songs, I, you know, I have to say two of the songs on the Aggravated Assault record were Graveyard Shift records initially. Um, and I put them on the Aggravated Assault record. Tombstone is on it, and so it's saying on two of those songs on Aggravated Assault. So, yeah, it was a lot of hype. And we were looking at probably a, a lawsuit uh, because in one sense, I'm kind of a thug, relatively Sony artist, uh, but Suge Knight, he put, you know, he put the advance up. And I was putting it out on, uh, on Death Row. That was right about the time he went to jail the first time. Wow. And, you know, I'll just... Shit, I know it's crazy. I oh, just went to shit. It was it was kind of a crazy time, but it had that thing, man. It was really something special, and it's still actually kind of special because that type of music, kind of like graveyard shit, it's called timeless. Uh, it's not. Oh, yeah, I I, I think of a track like somebody's got to die. You know what I mean? And and even to this day, as as soon as I hear, you know, that somebody's got to die, I'm like, oh shit! Like I mean, it it is really. It makes you think graveyard shift. It makes you think of mo thugs. It makes you think of bone. But then it makes you think of something new all at the same time when you hear that record because it's got all the different little elements that you were doing the whole time. Finally, you know the grand finale of them all together on one record instead of just cut up into little stabs of genius over multiple records. No doubt. And you said it. Somebody got to die. That song on aggravated assault record. Lazy, I'm talking crazy. I mean, he smashes it. I mean, so who? Let me see the order of the song. Somebody got to die, right? Uh, somebody got to die. So Coolio, he shouldn't even been on the right because man, a crazy bone came in with my black khakis and my black boots. Yeah. He came in so he, he he came in so hard, and he's actually talking about carrying. Tombstone in the box, uh, you know that's that's what his verse is about in that song. I mean that song, that whole record, that whole album had so much to do with so much that went on in our lives. I'm talking about probably a multi platinum record that, you know, because whatever happened with Suge Knight, it got sat on, and you know, of course I did 30 songs so I could put 30 more out tomorrow. But you know, I just don't, I don't know how I even feel about it. I would rather. A group of fans say, hey, man, I really want to hear that. I'll fucking send it to them because it's not about the money. I just don't want to get sued. Like Graveyard Shift, the reality is when I put that record out on the Internet, I figured any day I was going to get served from Sony. 
They never did. Wow. And it's because wow. it's because Alan Grumblack, Cliff Culturary, they knew they probably knew how I felt about it. I was like, Go ahead and sue me. But I feel like it the actual graveyard shift, the original twelve or thirteen songs, I'm not not graveyard shift, aggregated salt, somebody from Death Row, if I don't get a release, they would probably sue me because I was definitely it was signed up to go on Death Row and I mean, Dr. Dre loved it. I played Graveyard Ship with Dr. Dre when I was doing Aggravated Salt, and he went nuts. He was like, what is this? I said, yeah, this is some shit that we never got to put out. So a lot of Graveyard folded into Aggravated Assault. Hmm. That makes sense. I mean, they sound very, you know, they sound very similar. And I have to say the title, Aggravated Assault, is where I was. Uh, Aggravated Assault, it's called Romeo's uh, 245. 245 is the California Penal Code for Aggravated Assault. The name of the album is called Romeo's 245. Group is Aggravated Assault. And everything on that record is very agitated, very irritated, and very in, f- in your fucking face and nasty and mad. And I put like a nasty sound and distortion on my guitar to make it it's not a sweet sound in Carlos Santana sound. It's a nasty fucking sound to make you to make your ears be like, oh damn, I don't like that. Well, I did that for a reason. I don't want you to like it. I did it because I want you to be aggravated when you hear it. And there's a tone on a Marshall amp that you turn the treble up and the mid uh, the mid range down and the you know the, the low end down. You turn the treble up. It, it kind of hurts your teeth, and it's not really a great sound. But if you want to get people's attention, you turn them off on the treble up. And that's what I did on that aggravated salt record. I was like, okay, I'm going to get some people's attention. And uh, I mean, the, just the, you know, the title, Aggravated Assault. We aggravated salt niggas with felony tendons. We got the prosecutor worried about. The, oh, yeah, on aggravated assault, we did, um, oh, I did a soundtrack on the Blair Witch soundtrack. Oh, Blair Witch. Um, we got the prosecutor worried about the Blair Witch stories. Uh, 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 Who's rapping that part? I think that one. I forgot. I don't know, man. I, it, there's so much music in there. One yeah. day I would like to send it to people who care. You know, not for commerciality, but that's why I held Graveyard Shift, because it wasn't supposed to be commercial. And I don't think it is. You know the song that Lazy's on is very commercial. But yeah, listen, no, I have to say this. This is, this is really important. You have to give me the space to say this. I did a song called No Photo. It's on the Graveyard Shift record. And Lazy Bones on it um, with Tombstone and Sin. Now, I don't know. You be the judge. Everybody be the judge. So the guitar lick in No Photo <clears throat> is the same guitar lick in the Eminem song. Um, what Eminem song? You know, the big one that was on all the commercials and shit like that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I haven't... Lose yourself? Yep. Check out Lose Yourself. There's the track. Listen to the guitar clip. And then check out No Photo, the instrumental version, if you can find it. If not, I'll send it to you. I don't give a fuck. It's the same fucking guitar lick. I mean, the same. The difference is, I did Graveyard Shift in 97. So people listen to it and go, damn, you got ripped off. Nah, I don't see it like that. If I inspired somebody to do it that way, uh, then it's an inspiration. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, a few lawyers was like, man, you know, you can get filthy rich if you pursue this. I was like, yeah, I don't know. I think about it. I haven't really pursued I told Lacey Bone about it. He actually, we talked about it. He said, do you know that song we did? I was like, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Because <laughs> it sounds, the guitar lick is just like it. And we actually oh, know, amazing. we actually know the person, he's a producer, that actually let, Dr. Dre here, where he got that lick. We know how he got to him, by the way. Uh, and like I said, yeah, we do. Lazy Bone knows, I know. and We could go there if we want to, and I don't know. If I, you know, if I get flat, broke, dead, and dusted, and, and you know, I might do it, but I I'm think pretty, that, I'm pretty sure Jeff Bass is, is who did the, the Lose Yourself, uh, at least, production. Yeah, he gets it. You know, but most of the stuff came from somewhere or the other. And Dr. Dre heard Brave Guy Ship and loved it. And so if you listen to the song, I'm just saying, listen to No Photo, block out the rap, 
and listen to that guitar lick. And the only thing that separates it is tone. That was done on a mine was done on a Marshall and that one was done on a I don't know, probably a boogie or Mesa Boogie. That's the only wow. difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's the I'll, same. I'll have to do a same. video on that. Well, it's it's a you don't lose your stuff. You know that chunk 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 right? That's the lick. That's a militant staccato, you know, cadence. Chunk chunk chunk. I got that from Bone Thugs and Harmony. That's why I did it in '97 on Graveyard Shift. That's what Bone Thugs and Harmony. That's how they rap. Chunk 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 right? So if you listen to Lose Yourself, listen to that guitar lick, and you tell me if that ain't. You know what I'm saying? Where I got that lick from? Is it? It's that's crazy. crazy. That, yeah. Some people no, say that's know. the biggest Eminem song of all fucking time. I mean, to you know, to it even is. kind of think about that, you know, you and Bone and everybody could have could have been the influence there. And 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 I know that to be you know factual that even like the guitar piece kind of got added later for that because there's versions of Lose Yourself uh, that were early versions where, yep. you know, he rapped a little, little bit different. They didn't have the guitars. The beat was different. Um, That's right. And then they did so a remix on it, and it came with that guitar lick. And yeah. that's one that I, that's when Lazy actually reached out. He's like, hey, man, uh, you hear this song? I was like, yep. <laughs> because it's so obvious. You know, it's like, that's the kind of... Tur- 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 tur. I did it on so many graveyard shift songs and bone songs. The graveyard shit, I would turn the distortion on so it would sound like the lose your stuff lick. Uh, but I did that in 97, 96 even. It was supposed to come out in 97. I probably did in 96. I don't know, man. I mean, you know, one, of the, I don't know. one of the fan questions about the, the graveyard shift release, because like we, like we talked about, it, it did eventually see the light of day when, when you released it to fans in 2001. Uh, Shane, he, he runs a website, bookofthugs.com. He's probably one of the top bone thug collectors in 2018. Uh, he wanted to know more about why, when it was finally released, you decided to alter that title and change it to, you know, Romeo Antonio, Romeo's GYS slash Stillwaters. Was that to, to work around label stuff, or what, what was that, you know, change piece? Yeah, if I would have called it uh, Graveyard Shift Stillwaters, then I, I would – I was wide open for Sony lawsuits. So the person, it was a, you know, I don't want to say his name. I've been saying his name too much, but at the record company that says, you might want to change the name so we don't have to sue you. I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. And that's why I called it Romeo GYS. Because if it was Thanks. just Do Waters by Graveyard Chef, yeah. You know, it would yeah. be probably over Cliff Coltrane and Alan Grumblatt's head. It would have went to the legal department, and which is Sony, and yeah, they would have, they would have sued me. But it's Romeo's GYS uh, because it's my favorite out of the thirty. Those are my favorite picks, and um, those are the ones that are most prevalent that I had more to do with than anybody else. You know, because they're more guitar based, and even the beats though. But see. I want the fans to know that Tombstone was that dude, too. He really was, man. He was a rock dude. Like, he was so different from Bone. And, um, you know, somebody told me something, and I don't, I don't want to hear it, but somebody told me that one of the Bone dudes said, none of the Motugs group will ever be as big as we are. And um, Archie Blaine told me that. Archie Blaine is the producer, the original producer from uh, Too True. Great yeah. guy. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, he's not he's been with well. Bone. I mean, he was on the – Archie produced on the Faces of Death record when they were so Bone Enterprise. Uh, well, Bob, Bobby well, actually did as well. And, and just just for you, just so you know, since we've been on this interview, I had posted up that uh, that we were interviewing you. And, and Bobby Jones jumped on it, and he said, ask Romeo – who got him on the recordings at Private Island Tracks? You know, it's funny he says that because that was, you know, we talked about Private Island Tracks. And um, I was on with Bobby. He definitely, uh, Bobby was one of the first ones, but so was Archie Blaine. He, um, uh, uh, Bobby Jones can't take all the credit for that. Archie Blaine came in from Cleveland. Uh, Bobby did too, but Too True was the first, a record and Tutu was signed to Archie Blaine. 
before they were signed to Motug. In fact, I have to say this. They had a, a deal with Def Jam. Um, you, you should probably, if you can, if you can Two True, yes. Uh, Two True was huge. Um, uh, just like in Cleveland, Two True had a huge, uh, big, bigger name than any of the Motug. And uh, Archie Blaine, uh, you know, he owned their contract pretty much. He was the producer of Two True. And, you know, Bobby had done some stuff, too, with a bunch of, you know, but Archie, and I, I don't want to uh, say it's my place, but if you want to talk to Archie Blaine about it, you might want to do that so he can give you kind of, you know, the, the, you know, of what, who did what and all that kind of stuff. But the way I understood it was that Archie had two true and Lazy had, you know, the other motos, and they kind of blended them together and made, like, one big family, that sort of thing. And that's how Archie told it to me anyway, and that's how I saw it. I mean, Archie was – first, when I walked in, I was besides Bone, you know, it was Bobby Jones, there, there was Archie, Unique was around, you know. So they had three or four, maybe three producers that came in from Cleveland, and I ended up working with all three of them. And then – I, uh, I, I'm not going to say took over because Bobby Jones was in the middle of it all, and he's a very talented guy. Bobby Jones is a great guy, too. He's fantastic. If you're listening to this, Bobby, I love you, and you know it. Uh, but Archie also, I can't say enough good things about Archie either. He wasn't as sophisticated production-wise as Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones is super smart as a, you know, production-wise. But Archie was kind of a from-scratch dude. Archie, I think, has a lot to do with the bone sound, like their particular sound. And, you know, I was talking to Lazy a couple of weeks ago, and Rob, the guy that, the Rob Rob we're talking about, uh, he hit me up and he had Archie Blaine on like a conference call with all of them. I was like, no way. So I called, and Archie was on the phone. And I started talking to Archie, man. We talked like old times and so good talking to Archie Blaine and, in fact, you know, for the Cleveland Film Festival, I'm going to see him while I'm there. And his health, you know, isn't as good as some of, you know, some of the rest of us. He went down in health on some things. So I'm going to see him. And we talked about some things. And I want to... 